just because Jesus existed doesn't mean he is God. The Bible right. is a document that says that Jesus is God. Yeah. But there are several other documents which may say Jesus existed, but he is not God. There's more documents favoring one side, and there's this one document favoring the other. Everyone should be, technically, if by our, by our means of measuring things, inclined to believe the other side. like a professor I debated up in Connecticut. He said, the only time that I accept something as historically reliable is if everybody agrees on it. Okay, I disagree with that, and I think you do as well. Okay, good. Now, the obvious question that you've been raising is, how many people have to tell you about an historical figure before you're going to believe that that figure lived, right? No. Okay, then what is your point? How many reliable sources from that time, not people around them, not people after, not people, how many, how many reliable sources from that time? From that time. From that time, from around the world, there's two kinds of people. If someone didn't believe Jesus was God, he should have still written about his speech, but no one did. Okay, so let me make sure I've understood you correctly. You, in order to believe that an historical event took place, have to have multiple people living at that time who wrote about it. Have I understood you correctly? At that time with different, with different inclinations. Not, with different not inclinations. Not people who are connected to each other, not people Good. who live in the same Do you know place. what you have just wiped out? All of ancient history. You've just wiped out Greco history, Roman history. You're telling me you can't accept any history that does not have a plethora of eyewitnesses who disagreed with each other, all writing at that time. You've just wiped out all Roman history, all Greek history, all Israelist history. You've just write, wiped out all Arab history. That was pretty effective. Herodotus. That is intellectually dishonest. Oh, no, it's not. It, it is really, the absolute really, truth. It really, really is. Who do you trust to tell you about ancient Greece? A guy named who? Herodotus. Who do you trust? And who are all these other people who wrote about, who were, who, who were at that time? And Herodotus wrote about events that were hundreds of years before him. Hundreds of years. How do you find out about a guy named Alexander the Great? Because you have a bunch of eyewitnesses who were Alexander the Great's buddies who wrote about him? No, sir. You do not. You see how naive you guys are when it comes to history? There's archaeological evidence. There is archaeological evidence in the Bible, too. That Jesus existed? Archaeological evidence. There is. What yeah. so you actually have is one individual claiming that 500 people saw the resurrection of Christ. And if your burden of evidence for believing something is you can't prove it's not true and one person said it, I could believe that's. I could believe anything. I could believe absolutely anything. I could believe in the tooth fairy because if someone wrote that the tooth fairy existed and he said that 500 people saw the tooth fairy exist, that would be precisely the same amount of evidence that exists for the resurre resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, All right. We're going to have to start at ground level here, ground zero. There is a difference between scientific knowledge and historical knowledge. Scientific knowledge is based on the repeatability of an experiment. If you prove something scientifically here at UT, but you cannot show it in London, England in a lab, it's not science. Science is based on your ability to repeat the experiment that taught you something. And if you can't repeat the experiment, it is not scientific knowledge. Historical knowledge has nothing to do with repeatability. You don't haul Abraham Lincoln back in here in a lab and have him assassinated by John Wilkes Booth every September. That is not historical knowledge. Historical knowledge is based on a single event, eyewitnesses seeing it, and they write what they see. Science, you've got to be able to repeat it. If you can't repeat it, it's not science. History, you never repeat. You record what you see, people do, they write it down. 
That is why when you guys say, scientifically, you've got to prove the resurrection. You're in the wrong class, guys. You don't scientifically prove that Washington was the first president of the United States. You historically verify it by eyewitness testimony. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. When you and I put our faith in Christ, he leads us through life. He leads us into God's presence. He leads us into our purpose in life. He leads us into an understanding of our value. He leads us into life eternal, giving us a great hope. Albert Einstein was a brilliant man. He had an interesting marriage. He had rules for his wife. First rule was three meals a day. Second rule was do my laundry. Third rule was keep my desk clean and I'm the only one to use it. And fourth rule was Whenever I'm tired of listening to you talk and I ask you to leave the room, you must leave the room quietly. Einstein and his wife were divorced. That list of four things that Einstein had for his wife that we've seen in some of the letters that have been auctioned recently are a sign of what for many marriage was like in 1914. The expectations were amazing. Many people say, well, we've evolved beyond that kind of trivializing a human being today. Really, have we? When you look at a lot of romance, a lot of marriage today, what becomes clear is we depend on each other to meet our deepest existential needs for meaning, for purpose, for value, for romance, for passion, for fun, for joy in life. Those are incredibly unrealistic expectations to place on one human being. When you and I move away from God, when you and I move away from Jesus Christ, we have to find a way to meet those deepest longings that all of us have. You and I have been hardwired to understand the value of our lives, to understand the purpose of our lives, to understand ethics and how we should live our lives morally. You and I have a deep longing for a great hope, a great hope for the future. A young man recently said to me, Cliff, your hope in Christ, your hope in heaven is such a naive hope, it's scary. And I said, really? Please tell me what your hope is and what your hope is based on. And he said, well, my hope is based on me doing a good job, me getting a good career, me making money, me being healthy. And I said, sir, do you see how naive your hope is? Your hope is based on that which is incredibly finite amazingly inconsistent and unreliable. How do you know you're not going to trip climbing the corporate ladder? How do you know you're not going to come down with cancer and heart failure? How do you know that your life is going to be fulfilling in the relationships that you have in the future? You don't know that, neither do I. Now, yes, do you and I have dreams that we aim for in this life? Sure we do, and that's good and appropriate. But to base your hope your great hope on your ability to produce and the ability of other people to bring you joy. Watch out. That is a naive hope. Jesus Christ said, I am the light of the world. Whoever comes to me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Whoever follows Christ, Christ is going to lead you into real love. He's going to meet the deepest need that you have for love and that will free you to love others better. He will strengthen you to lay your life down in serving others. And that's the only way to build a deep, meaningful relationship. If you're a narcissist, you are condemning your life to incredibly superficial relationships. You won't be able to give to another person. You're just preoccupied with your own self, and that will alienate you from others. But as you learn to rest in the security of Christ's love, as you follow him, he will meet your deep need for profound love. He will meet your deep need for deep value. He created you. He knows how you are to live your life in a flourishing, exciting, joyful way. When you follow Christ, he will lead you through emptiness, meaningless, into his deep purpose for you. Cliff, are you saying that followers of Christ never struggle with existential questions? No, I'm not saying that. 
obviously we're all broken people. But Christ wants to heal us, and he wants to draw us out of that existential loneliness, emptiness, dissatisfaction, fear, anxiety, and worry. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so when you put your faith in Christ, you begin a process. And that process is to grow closer and closer to Christ, to experience his love, his truth, his presence in deeper and more profound ways as you surrender your life to him. You can make that decision today to trust in Christ, to allow him to give you the great hope of eternal life in heaven, not the great hope of hopefully I'll realize the American dream in my life. No, the incredible hope of receiving eternal life by God's grace when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. I pray that you make that decision now and then that you begin the process of allowing Christ to meet those deep existential needs that every single human being on the face of the planet has. God bless you as you make that most important decision to trust in Jesus Christ. Moral relativism yeah. does not mean that there is an absence of morals. I never said that. I said moral relativism means there are no absolute morals, no objective morals. Obviously, every moral relativist creates their own morals. Obviously. Right? There, there was a time before Christianity, and humanity was not just murderous. And I mean, before and after. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Right. So there were ways that human beings created a stable civilization yes. without the moral teachings of Jesus Christ. Absolutely correct. And all of my atheist friends are very moral people. And all of Every these, one of my atheist friends is a very nice guy. And all of these Every one of them. All of these moral sets that guided civilizations before Christianity were developed independently from each other, and people were not really any more brutal or less brutal than we they agree. were right before and right after they converted agree. to Christianity. People who've never heard about Christ can live very moral lives. In fact, all of my atheist friends live very moral so lives. were all of these separate moralities developed from the word of a different God, or is it possible that humans have an innate sense of reciprocity and uh, an ability to develop morals without the word of the God? Obviously, you can develop a moral system as an atheist who believes there's no God. But what you cannot okay, do so is, what you cannot do is, gospel? you cannot say or live your life as if the moral system that you created is absolutely right. But it's long, it doesn't, that in is other irrelevant words, as long as in it's other words, agreed upon. If I say to a KKK person, racism is wrong, if I'm a moral relativist, what I have to say is, not racism is wrong, I have to say, from my perspective, Racism is wrong, but I realize because there is no God, there's no moral absolute, so for your perspective, my KKK friend, racism is right. I am not right, you're not wrong, you're not right, I'm not wrong, it's all relative, guys. It's just a taste. And I'm telling you guys that you know that Dr. Martin Luther King was on to something when he talked about the value of all people created in the image of God, which is why segregation and racism is absolutely wrong. And James Baldwin, the black author, poured scorn on people who said, well, we know why racism is wrong, because the intellectual ethics professors at Harvard and Yale say it's wrong. And James Baldwin said, you've got to be kidding me. You think racism is wrong because some dude in an ivory tower says it's wrong? Give me a break. Racism is wrong because all human beings are created with value, innate, intrinsic value, because they're created by God for a purpose, which means racism is wrong, not because I'm an educated white guy. No, racism is wrong because it is a violation of the innate value of a human being created in the image of God. You see the problem with relativism. You can't live it out. Share morals, they have to share. You, in your definition, they would have to share the same faith. 
No. Not necessarily. When the Muslim says to me, a Muslim rejects, a Muslim rejects Christ. When a Muslim says to me, there are moral absolutes, I have no problem, because the Muslim believes in, in some type of God. But when an atheist or an agnostic says to me, there are some type of moral absolutes, they're being intellectually dishonest. And they're either ignorant or they're being deceptive. I, I know people that know Hebrew because I've, I've learned it from my father and my father before and from my father before that. Good. Right, passed down from tradition from, from, from Sinai. Right. At Sinai, Jesus was not mentioned. Everything was given up there and brought down. Yeah. So you, you said 500 people discovered Christ. And what happens then? They all die? 500. So, so you understand what it says that we, now we cannot ask these 500 people what happened. Did you see this? No, because they're not there anymore. And we don't know who they are. But with, with 3 million people at, my, at Sinai who received the Torah from God, we can, I can trace that back. I can trace myself back to those three million people with specific names, all the way back to Moshe Rabbeinu, back to Moses. So how, how does that? How is that more? How does Christian? How is Jesus Christ more reliable than, than what the original is? What is based off? Of? <laughs> I would encourage you to put your faith in Jesus Christ because the evidence is, he died and really rose from the dead. He lived out the Torah magnificently. So the evidence is, he's consistent, and he's reliable. He was dead and he rose from the dead. So you can trust him. He didn't slam Moses. He agreed that Moses was inspired by God. I am a follower of Christ. I worship a Jew. I worship a Jew. Jesus was a Jew, not a Gentile. So all the anti-Semitism that has gone on in the name of Christianity is a farce, obviously, because a Christian is someone who worships a Jew. So if somebody says, I believe in Jesus and I'm going to go into a synagogue and blow Jews away. Major, major hypocrisy. Major breakdown in here. Major. If you're a Christian, you worship a Jew. You believe that God became a human being and he was a Jew. So anti-Semitism in the name of Christianity is a violent contradiction, obviously. I'm a Muslim, and um, most of the moral values I have, most of the things I abide by, uh, follow Christianity. There are some differences in detail. I do follow the Ten Commandments. Uh, Beautiful. And the problem I'm having is, uh, like you said earlier, right. history happens once. And, Thank you. Uh, the problem here is your history and my history change in various parts. And uh, just because I don't believe that Christ or Jesus was, you know, God or part of part of our God, mm -hmm. uh, I'm banished into hell. Or in some cases, in some, you know, sects, Christianity bans me from entering heaven. Uh, why is it that even if I live a moral life, why, why, why is it that even if I worship my God, uh, that you know, I'm I'm banished? Uh, in, into, in, into hell, just because our histories are, are, are different in this case. Okay, good question. Do you think that Jesus taught that the way to heaven is by living a good life, by keeping the Ten Commandments? Do you think that's what he taught? I, I guess, yeah. No. See, if you can go to heaven <coughs> by keeping the Ten Commandments, why did Jesus get nailed to a cross? He didn't need to, right? You see, what Jesus claims is, although I have tried to keep the Ten Commandments, I have failed. I have blown it. I'm not this great person that I wish you would believe that I am. I am a sinner. And according to Christ, I cannot work my way to heaven by working in a soup kitchen trying to do penance and make up for my bad lifestyle. Instead, I need God's grace which is his undeserved love, forgiveness, and generosity. When Jesus was dying on the cross, two thieves were hung on either side of him. The first thief turned to him and said, Come on, buddy, get us off these crosses, and then we'll believe in you. The second criminal turned to the first criminal and said, You fool, we bleed and die here because we deserve it. But this Jesus, he's the innocent, holy, pure Son of God. And the second criminal looked into Jesus' face and said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, right there, it's all on the line. 
Jesus could have looked the guy in the face and said, no problem, but first, you will get down and you will feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and do a bunch of good deeds. He didn't say that. Instead, he said, I tell you the truth, today you'll be with me in paradise. That's great. Undeserved, unmerited, unworked for, love, forgiveness, generosity. So either Christ is wrong, that the way to heaven is through his grace, or he's right, that I can never work my way to heaven by being a good guy and keeping the Ten Commandments. Instead, the way to heaven is through the sacrificial death of Christ on a cross to pay the penalty from my breaking the Ten Commandments. Now, when I receive God's grace, I am a hypocrite if I don't struggle to obey him. And so you coming into this culture will meet Christians, quote unquote, who have accepted Christ, put their faith in him, but they live like the devil. Don't believe them. When you put your faith in Christ, if your faith is genuine, you will struggle to change and with his help, obey the Ten Commandments, obey the Sermon on the Mount, live that quality of life. No politician, no legislative body can change your heart can change your character. That takes God. That takes Christ. And one of the ways that Jesus wants to change America, change all societies, all cultures, is by building stronger families. A strong family is based on a marriage that's healthy and parenting that is good. A healthy marriage comes when both spouses are allowing God allowing Christ to meet their deepest emotional, spiritual, and psychological needs. If you think that your spouse can meet your deepest needs, you're sadly mistaken. If I think that my spouse can meet my deepest emotional, spiritual, and psychological needs, I am sadly mistaken. It is not fair to depend upon one spouse to meet the deepest needs of your life. It ain't going to happen. Our spouses are tremendous gifts from God, but they're not God. And if they're placed in the number one spot in your life or in my life, that will lead to keen disappointment, frustration, and stress. An African proverb puts it well when it says, When the elephants fight, the grass is crushed. When mom and dad fight, children are crushed, hurt deeply. That should cause us to pause before fighting and to figure out how we can bring about compromise, peace, how we can allow love to flow instead of animosity. What a challenge it is to build strong families, especially in light of the fact that opposites attract. I'll never forget coaching soccer for kindergartners. My son was on the team, and he was one of the aggressive children who ran after the ball, tried as hard as he could to kick it into the goal. He, were, he was joined by many young ladies, girls, and young men, boys, in that endeavor. But my defense had a problem. The boys and girls on defense like to sit down on the lawn, on the grass, and find four-leaf clovers. It almost made me pull my hair out as the offense of the other team would come breathing down on them and they'd be sitting there looking for four-leaf clovers. Many of us are very spontaneous, very laid back, very chill. Others of us are aggressive, hard-driving, type A personalities. When you put those two together, wow, that can lead to some real misunderstanding and stress and pressure and disagreement. So a good marriage is comprised of two people who are willing to accept each other the way we are. We're willing to bear with each other, which means to give the other person space to be different and unique. We're to be patient with each other and to cut each other slack, and we are to forgive each other, which means to absorb the pain and not lash back in revenge. Yes, that is the quality of love a love that accepts, a love that bears, a love that's patient, a love that forgives. That's the quality of love 
that Christ wants to use to glue our marriages solidly together. Recently, my oldest son asked me, Dad, what was the most important lesson that Grandpa and Grandma taught you? I thought a moment and responded rather quickly. Dad had a passionate love for Christ. Dad understood that God loved him more than anybody else in the whole universe loved him. And because of that, Dad responded to God's love. Grandpa responded to God's love with a passionate love. And he modeled that for his six children, and he taught us to love Jesus more than anyone. And that's exactly what Jesus said is the purpose of life, to love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And mom, your grandma, Robert, well, she taught us an accurate definition of success. She played five sports in college. She was quite the athlete. She served as a nurse at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. She had an amazing intellect and incredibly athletic body. But she was wise enough and committed enough to Christ to understand the true definition of success, which is not to be number one athletically, and it's not to have the highest GPA in school. Instead, success is faithfulness. Faithfulness is taking all that God has given you and using it to serve God by serving others. Faithfulness is the peace that comes from knowing you did the best you could in that situation. Success is not measured by where you stand in the pecking order. Success is not measured by do you have the corner office with the best view. Success is measured not by the size of your house or the cost of your car. Instead, success is living to glorify God in everything, living to serve people to the best of your ability, understanding that the real purpose of life is to love God and to love others, to move out of self-absorption into giving your life away in serving others. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ did. He gave his life away in serving others, and ultimately he sacrificed his life for you and for me as he bled and died on a cross to forgive us for our wrongdoing, to forgive us for our sin, to reconcile us to God and to give us life eternal. Have you accepted that gift? Have you asked Christ to forgive you? Have you put your faith and trust in Him and received the gift of eternal life that Jesus promises to all who trust in Him? Have you committed your life to living for Him? And when it comes to family, to building a strong family by His grace, God bless you as you make that most important decision to trust in Jesus Christ. I'm the pastor of Grace Community Church. We meet every Sunday at 9.30 at Grace Farms, which is located at 365 Luke's Wood Road in New Canaan, Connecticut. Won't you join us this Sunday for our 9.30 service? Thanks for spending these few minutes with us. Have a great day.